Welcome to Pathways, a career podcast from the Idaho State University Career Center. I'm your host, Mark Beaver. Today, we're speaking with Daniel Sheldon, Assistant Lecturer in the Communication, Media, and Persuasion program at Idaho State University. Daniel is a man of many interests and many talents, and he's found a way to incorporate all of them into his life. But it wasn't always so easy. It took a couple major barriers and letdowns for him to kind of realize what he really wanted out of life and how to find his balance. Please settle in and listen to our conversation with Daniel. Hey, Daniel, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you. So you have, there's a few different reasons why I wanted to talk to you. One, you do have a, a title here at ISU that we see often, but maybe I don't know if everybody knows exactly what it means. So it'd be interesting to kind of hear uh, what your actual job here is at ISU. But also, I know that you're also involved in a lot of things outside of ISU. And mm-hmm. I'm really interested in coming back around to that life balance a little bit as well. But to start us off, can you can you tell us about your your job title here at ISU and what you do and, and how that fits in? So I'm an assistant lecturer here at the Communication, Media, and Persuasion Department within the College of Arts and Letters. And I teach basic classes. I teach 1101 uh, Fundamentals of Oral Calm. I teach that kind of level of class. And then I also teach freshman orientation. One of the differences about most lecturer positions, and I don't want to speak for all lecturer positions, but it's mostly focused on teaching, whereas a lot of professorships are more focused on research or academic uh, pursuits outside of the classroom. But I get to spend basically all of my time focused just on students. How can I make things better in the classroom without worrying about um, have I published a paper recently Mm, or cutting edge research? I can just focus on students in the classroom. So you do you have to have uh, like a PhD or a doctoral degree to hold this position? So for my position, I just need a master's degree. Okay. And so that's why my students can call me Mr. Sheldon, but not doctor. I'm not technically a doctor. Yeah. I have not earned that yet. Right, right. I, I mean, I'm in the same place. I teach classes too, and I don't have a doctoral degree. But we do have a couple different kind of classifications for, for, a, for a teacher in that position. We have clinical professors, um, mm-hmm. assistant lecturers. Um, so I guess what what made you what attracted you to this job so i accidentally stumbled across this position and i originally was coming back from la moving back to pocatello and didn't even want to go to grad school Mm -hmm. and met with some friends and they were like daniel you need to go to grad school you're really good at school go back to grad school and i was like all right fine i'll go back to grad school and a position opened up halfway through my my grad school where I could be a GTA, graduate teaching assistant, mm-hmm. where I could get paid and also teach classes. So I didn't have to pay for tuition, and it was awesome. And I accidentally loved that too much. <laughs> and I, I fell in love with interacting with students, with teaching things, with learning things myself, because I think one thing that – the teachers don't get to talk about how much is how much they learn from teaching these classes right. and it's wonderful it is uh awe inspiring at times and i finished my graduate school in 2018 and a position happened to open up that same year somebody else was retiring and i applied and thankfully got it and i've been teaching here full time ever since that's awesome that's awesome with that gta how did you pursue that? Did someone tell you about that? How did you figure out about like that kind of – is this something you knew going into grad school? So I knew that it existed, but I knew that there weren't any slots open. Mm-hmm. And then somebody left halfway through the semester, and then that became open. Right. And so then I looked into it more, and somebody approached me, and I was like, hey, do you want this? Here's how you apply for it. And it was pretty simple. Just wrote in a, an essay, talked about, and then gave them the materials that I needed, like my transcript, things of that nature. And – it made a world of difference because right. going from having to pay five thousand dollars a semester to not getting not having to do that and also getting paid a stipend was a massive difference. Right. And all of a sudden it was easy to go to school again and that was wonderful. Yeah. And that's huge. And that's the reason I brought that up. I think a lot of our students, you know, when they're thinking about like, should I go to grad school, should I not? The the kind of the first thing in their mind is I don't know how I'm ever going to pay back all the loans yep. from going those extra years, but there's a lot of ways to, to get money for grad school. I mean, GTAs are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
especially if you're not in kind of like a research funded field as much. Um, but on the other side, like scientific fields, there's a lot of research funding. If you're involved in a, in a project, a large research, you can get a lot of grant funding to get paid to go to grad school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even things like taking a year off and doing AmeriCorps and getting some kind of like education stipend. But yeah, I think it's just great. Like students got to put themselves out there if they don't know about those things and kind of like poke around and ask around, like, how do I get how do I get paid? How do I make this easier? It is amazing how just a simple question of, hey, are there any funding opportunities, scholarship opportunities, anything along those lines, just asking the, the people at the head of the department can often change the answer. Uh, they go from, well, I don't really know anything about that. Let me ask one email. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, here are all the opportunities that this department has that maybe I didn't know about before. Right. And that takes like a little bit of gumption. I mean, I don't know about yourself, yeah. but I mean, for a lot of people, like, yeah, it takes it, it. You got to work it up a little bit to be able to go in and talk to a, a doctoral professor. It it's, can seem a little intimidating mm-hmm. at times, and to ask for something to kind of like put yourself out there like that. Like, I need money, but I mean, if, like you said, once you do that, like just taking that step can make it that, that can change everything for someone. I mean, one of the fascinating things about being involved in like all the meetings and talking to all my uh, fellow colleagues is that everybody wants to help out Mm. and i I don't think a student's ever come to me and been like hey i need help with with finance or i need help with this how can i help even if i point them in a different direction i go i i don't know if i can help you but let me see if they if they can nobody's ever like how dare you ask this question it's always like hey we're gonna try we're gonna work on this and the answer may not be yeah here's all this money but there's usually uh steps that people can take to help out and at the end of the day everybody just wants to help you uh get your education yeah yeah it's in, it's you know it's interesting how many times i've heard that during this podcast from yeah people in every type of position at this university is just like hey man our job is to help students succeed mm-hmm. that is our number one goal and so yeah i mean i think that's just such a, a a big barrier for a lot of a lot of students to kind of overcome whether they're you know 18 and just starting out or you know later in life coming back to school maybe for the first time Mm -hmm. that idea of putting yourself out there isn't as scary when you know that basically everyone here is actually rooting for you yeah yeah it's always fascinating to me whenever i get a student email either late at night or on a weekend and they're like oh i'm really sorry about this question no don't be that's that's my job i am here to help you if you are confused about something, it's my job to help that. Right. And and so I love it when students reach out and they're like, this this doesn't make sense. I need help here because that's when I feel like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is what I'm in here to do, and that's when I when I can clarify those things. Feels pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, I'd also add that you know, I'm I'm, I'm also a little skeptical of the students who aren't asking questions. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it just makes me wonder, like, are you engaged enough? to be wondering about any of this. Because I I don't know about you, but I'm not so confident in my teaching abilities sure, that, I, right. that at the end of the class I go, no one should have any questions. <laughs> I was perfectly clear. Right, right. I'm the greatest. Right. Mic drop. That's class. Yeah. yeah. I know that there's something I said that didn't make sense. Sure. So if somebody doesn't ask me a question, I'm just terrified what it was. Right. Right. Okay. This will show up in a paper somewhere. Yep. Big gap. And I mean, at least as a professor, sorry, as a, as a lecturer, you can kind of at least know that Oh, that must have been on me. Yep, <laughs> if I'm seeing absolutely. this across like a number of, of papers, this gap that I was expecting, and there's a number of students kind of not filling it, that's probably my fault. Um, so from like an actual work aspect, um, I think you probably touched on a lot of things that you enjoy about this job. You, you said you, you just love it. You love, mm-hmm. you, I mean, it seems like you love teaching. Um, you love learning. Um, is there anything else just for, like purely from like a working aspect that this job gives you that, that you really enjoy? I always like being able to collaborate with others on on like academic pursuits mm. of, of the question of like, all right, our students are struggling to understand this concept. How do we fix that? Mm. Mm-hmm. How do we best teach that? And then getting into groups and figuring out, all right, I like to teach it this way. I do this thing. And... It's fascinating how many people have really good ideas that I've never had before. Yeah. And be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Let me steal that and combine it with this thing that I learned from this person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's been wonderful. And then watching students grow, I think, is the main reason that I enjoy doing this. Is especially in in the department that I teach, where a lot of students are terrified of public speaking when they first yeah. take their course. And yeah. at the end, 
they still may not love it because it is a skill that I think a lot of people maybe never truly learn to love. Sure. But they're a little bit more confident. And what, just watching that growth and being like, yeah, I, I helped with that yeah. is a very empowering feeling. Yeah. So – it is. It is. And I mean, that's also, I mean, I, I, that's also something that I feel like I hear everyone say, mm -hmm. and it's like, I, it's the same with me. I mean, I'm not saying it's like contrived or anything. That's why we're in this yeah. it's to like, see that growth is like knowing you're making a difference is it kind of makes it all worth it a mm -hmm. little bit. When you think about like, you know, the big questions, what are we all doing here? You yep. know? And it's like, well, I made a difference in someone's life mm -hmm. and that's a pretty good reason. Um, but going back, you were talking about that, how, how you love kind of, it almost sounds like problem solving. Yes. Like very large scale. Is that, is that something that you've kind of always recognized in yourself as, as something that, that, you, that you just enjoy in life in general? I love a good brain teaser. No. I love anything that makes me go, all right, this isn't working. How do I make it work? Especially when it comes to people, because I've often found like, Oftentimes, when people are frustrated with one another or when people have uh, frustrating experiences with one another, the main reason is because something went wrong in the communication. Right. And so being able to be like, all right, uh, this was said. This is how this was interpreted. How can we fix that? How can we change these things around in order to make it so that way what you said was actually what you meant to say? Yeah. And, and that kind of problem solving with people is, is very interesting to me. And being able to go like, all right, so I talked about this really high concept and it didn't land. How can I reword it or how can I use different examples? Right. How can I be more relatable? Something along those lines. And I have found that just sparkling in Fortnite references doesn't work anymore. I have tried it. It didn't work at any time. And my classes all just roll their eyes whenever I try to be cool. Yeah. So I've given up on trying to be cool. Yeah. But there are, there are definitely still like difficulties in being like, all right. How do I how do I get this information across as clearly as possible? Is a very fun puzzle to have. Yeah, yeah, I love it, and I also love the the kind of flexibility that you have in in like this context in a college classroom to be mm -hmm. a little experimental. Yeah, with how you're going to do that, um, and I think you know I I myself graduated from undergrad with a, a secondary education degree, okay. and very quickly decided that teaching in the K twelve uh, atmosphere wasn't for me. I don't know how teachers do it. I it is unbelievable to me. It's that, the most important job, yes. and the hardest job, and one of the most underappreciated jobs. Yes. And I wish I could have, but it just wasn't for me. And I remember telling um, a friend of mine, their father, like, you know, what I'd really like to do is go get a master's, and and then just teach mm -hmm. at the college level. And he said, mm, No, you got to have a PhD to do that. Like you can't, you can't teach at the college, you know, and that was his understanding. Mm -hmm. So I actually put that dream on the back burner for a long time. And then, you know, coming back around, kind of realizing later, I got a master's for something unrelated to teaching um, and then realized that I could actually incorporate it. And I understand, you know, like I have a lot of students say, I want to teach at college. And I say, well, are you planning to do a PhD or an ED? And they're like, well, I don't really know. And I'm like, well, you can, but, you know, these jobs are a little bit limited, mm -hmm. but they are really great. There's a lot of flexibility in how you can solve problems, try to reach, like, these different goals through different avenues without, you know, necessarily having standards and yeah. testing, yeah. you know, breathing down your neck necessarily. Um, so those kind of ideas, like problem solving, bringing people together, you said you've kind of always liked these. Um, I guess this kind of leading me to, what what does this job give you? What does it allow you in your life that opens up other parts in your life? And and how does that translate to some of those parts? Well, I will say that there's a lot of things that I like about teaching outside of the the actual job itself. Mm -hmm. The the hours are pretty good. I, I work most days nine to five and then I'm good to go and I'll check my email every now and then. And some days I've got off because nothing to grade. And that allows me to do a lot of things in the community that I really like to do. Mm -hmm. And so I do things like I do improv comedy in the community. I do theater around town. Mm -hmm. I'm in Arsenic and Old Lace that goes up in mm -hmm. – that not goes up. That we have our second showing uh, this – tonight. Oh. And awesome. so I get to do – tons of things that I'm passionate about. I get to 
I do Dungeons and Dragons within the community. I have my own podcast. Yeah. And all of these places in combination with Pocatello have, uh, to be just perfectly frank, given me a pretty good life. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty satisfied with where I'm at. And that wasn't always the case. And, like, I, and, and this is going to go a bit off topic, and I apologize for that. I always wanted to be an actor when I was growing up, mm -hmm. uh, or at least in high school and in college, I got a theater degree. And then I moved to L.A. to become an actor, and that went as well as most people that go to L.A. to become an <laughs> actor do, in that I auditioned for some very weird things that I never got. And I, the, the most I ever got paid was $75 to do a courtroom TV show called America's Court with Judge Ross that I've never actually seen an episode of, oh. nor do I totally know that this show exists at all. Right. And, the, and at the end of it, I was like, I'm chasing fame and I'm chasing money, but I'm not happy. I don't like right. this. The city isn't what I want it to be. The people aren't what I want them to be. And I, I was getting for judged for things that I didn't like. Like, I was constantly judged for my appearance. That's their job, right? They, I have to look a certain way on TV and not for my work ethic or for my ability to communicate or anything along those lines. Right. And so I, I moved back to Pocatello and, man, it's made a world of difference. When, when you can just find a place that you're happy at because not only of your job but because of the things you can do outside of it, it's world-changing. I mean, I know people that have much, quote unquote, better jobs than me and that they make a lot more money than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much, much more fancy than what I do. But at the end of the day, I'm a lot happier than a lot of them uh, just because I get to do what I love in a city that I love with people that I love. And that's that's meant a lot. Beautiful, beautiful. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Daniel Sheldon, assistant lecturer in the committee communications media and persuasion department at Idaho State University. Sorry, that's a mouthful. It is. Yeah. Yes, we just shortened it to CMP. Yeah, it's funny that it's hard to communicate that. Isn't it? Yeah, a little, a little bit, bit of irony there. Maybe it's just me. Um, I think what you just said is, is just beautiful. And it, it is something that we try to to impart to our students in, in the Career Center all the time, these ideas of um, of life balance and and you know making a job fit your values mm -hmm. not making your values fit a job yeah right um so i guess going back to that you said that you had wanted to be an actor for some time was that as far as you can remember like when you were a child what did you want to be when you grew up so when i was very very little i wanted to be a doctor because i loved watching house i loved watching <laughs> er those very real depictions so, of what doctors so it was do. still tied to to acting and... ironically yes yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah. and so i wanted to be a doctor i loved science i loved math and then i took an ap bio course in high school and it was the the toughest class I've ever taken yeah. to date. Yeah. And I went, oh, this is, an, this is a high school level class. Mm. I don't think I should be struggling this much if I'm actually going to be a doctor. Oh, boy, I think I need to figure out something else here. Yeah. And then I, I had been doing acting for a couple years, and I had loved that. And I think one of the reasons that I... Because I often get asked the question, like, do you regret getting a theater degree? Because, like, a theater degree is, quote, unquote, worthless. So mm -hmm. I bet you regret it. No, absolutely not. Sure. I loved my theater degree. And I think so many students get caught up on your degree has to be exactly what your job is going to be when you graduate. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think it does. I think your degree has to teach you things. And in, in my mm. theater degree, I learned how to communicate with others. I learned how to pick up skills quickly. I learned how to perform in front of others. I learned how to speak in front of others. And I learned how to work under pressure, all of which can translate to basically any job. Right. And I feel like so many students get hung up on like, well, I said I was going to be an engineer when I was five. I guess I'm going to be an engineer. Why? Yeah. If you don't like that thing, find something that you like. Because you're going to be way happier doing a job that, that fits your values, that gives you what you are looking for rather than some, something that your parents want you to do or something that you set yourself up to do when you were very little and didn't know any better. Right. Just 
do what you enjoy and you'll you'll find a job. There right. will always be a job for whatever it is you're looking for, especially in nowadays spaces. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I love that idea of just like, think about all those things you learned that are like what we might call like the soft skills or transferable mm -hmm. skills. Um, I also like in my undergrad, I changed my major multiple times, started out in biology and mm -hmm. hit the same point you hit. Yep. <laughs> um, I just, I, I made it another couple of years before, you know, before I had that hard realization. But at the same time, it kind of took a sociology class and had my mind blown mm -hmm. by that world. And, you know, I've had the same kind of question and then went back to grad school for something kind of semi unrelated, kind of combining um, a lot of the th stuff that I'd done. I also had an art minor throughout it all. So kind of like things that are not really associated with each other. Like, you know, I studied mm -hmm. social science and I studied biology and I studied art. And, you know, I get that same question. I mean, are you, are you, do you ever regret that, you know, you couldn't just stick with one thing and you switched all over the place and had to spend five years in school? And no, not at all. Like I learned, I got to learn about everything I wanted to learn about. Mm -hmm. Like I got to follow the things that were interesting to me. I still love biology. I just realized I wasn't going to pass those classes <laughs> at some point. And I needed to, you know, maybe get done with, with the actual college part. Um, but yeah, taking away, like, I mean, all the things that you can take away from those. And then I tacked on an education component at the end because I didn't really know what I was going to do with a social science degree besides possibly teach. Um, but yeah, like just being able to realize those things in, in the moment a little bit of, okay, like people are telling me there's not a lot of jobs in this field. People are telling me there's not a lot of money in this field. And we'll think about what else you're getting out of that. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that you're not necessarily going to be tied to that field. Right. Like you just said, there's going to be a job for you if you build up the right kind of skills. Some jobs necessitate certain skills. You mm -hmm. might not be able to be an engineer. I would be a very <laughs> poor engineer. I'll tell you that. Sure. Sure. Um, however, yeah, you have all these transferable skills. They're going to be working in many different, in many different areas. That's, mm -hmm. that's so important for, for people to be learning. Um, so I guess going back again, tell me a little bit more about that kind of like that. I mean, you kind of touched about that realization and transition from, from kind of like trying in LA and then, and then that transition or whatever you learned that kind of brought you back here. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, it was very interesting. And I think a lot of the, the transition was thanks to my work in undergrad because in undergrad, I, I was involved in everything. Mm. I. Uh, I was the president of the theater fraternity, Alpha Psi Omega. I did all sorts of work around the theater department and the community and the college. Like I, I went above and beyond, I think, mm -hmm. uh, to, to make sure that people remembered me. And so when I came back from L.A., my initial thought was I was working on a script at the time that I had since I have since finished mm -hmm. and produced here in Pocatello. And I was like, I really just want to work on this script. I want to work on my acting. I want to get a kind of a bit of a new start. Mm -hmm. And then I may tri go to Chicago or New York or somewhere else. But in the meantime, I knew I didn't want to be in LA anymore. And because of the connections that I had made in undergrad, I was approached by the, the dean of the College of Arts and Letters of Candy Turley Ames. She was mm -hmm. like, hey, come back to school. <laughs> And it's very difficult to tell the dean of the College of Arts and right. Letters, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so we, um, I applied and got in, and it was, it was eye opening to be back in school and feel like, I, oh yeah, 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 this is this is my environment. This is where mm -hmm. I really succeed. Mm -hmm. And then adding in that teaching layer and being like, oh, this is also where I succeed. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this. So I, I, when I was in LA, I'd worked at Buffalo Wild Wings as a server for, for a year. And being able to go from, I hate my job, I hate my job, and to the point where, and this sounds so bizarre, but I would have panic attacks in the middle of the night and I would wake up in, in like uh, stress sweats. Hmm. And I had had a nightmare that somebody had forgotten their ranch. Yep. And uh, I was going to get fired because I left somebody's ranch on the table next to them yeah. instead of bringing that to that table. And going to transition from that to, oh, this is, this is nice. Mm -hmm. This is where I feel at my best was fantastic. Right. And... Um, 
I don't actually know if I actually answered your question. Well, I think what um, maybe I was I was trying to kind of get at, and one, I worked in restaurants too, the, the most stressed dreams I've ever had yeah. are from when I'm working in restaurants. Um, I think working in restaurants, if you work in the right one, is fantastic. You meet a crazy wide array of people. It's um, true. You learn um, some really valuable skills. Mm -hmm. um, and you get to see things from the other side. Gives yes. you a little bit of respect for, <laughs> for, the, I for the firmly believe that with. everybody should work in food service for at least a little bit so yeah. they can understand how much it sucks when you complain at food service places. Right, right. But, um, you know, I guess what, what I was kind of curious of is um, how, how, you, how you took that. Um, I mean, it sounds like you, you had a positive thing to look forward and that you were going to be writing this script that mm -hmm. was still kind of in that wheelhouse. But I know that from personally knowing a few people who have been in in music or in the arts mm -hmm. um when they when they tried to kind of go and break through and it didn't work it has a tendency to kind of hit a little hard yes and so kind of balancing i was just i guess what i'm getting at and i didn't want to like put you on the spot on this but um like that that a lot of people might feel like a sense of failure before they can move on mm -hmm. and kind of realize some of these bigger things and like you seem really happy and like you found like so much zen in a kind of understanding where you truly can thrive. Mm -hmm. um, was that, uh, did you have to go through that and was that difficult or did you kind of already, did, are, you, are you well adjusted enough that you, <laughs> you already had that? Uh, oh on? no, not at all. Not even a little. I, I, I struggled a lot when I was in LA mm -hmm. of that, a concept of me being, me being a failure. When I was there for the first for the first month, I didn't have a house to live in. Mm. I was an Airbnb couch crasher, and then when I was leaving, I I also had that same that same thought of I I failed. Uh, all these people thought that I could succeed, and I didn't, and I couldn't, mm. and so I struggled with that immensely. But at the end of the day, I knew that this wasn't going to be a good fit for me, and I needed to do what was best for, for me and for my health and make a smart decision to go back, readjust, and figure out a, a new path forward. Because I hadn't, at that time, given up on acting as, as my actual profession. I just knew that it wasn't going to be in LA. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I struggled with for a really long time. But then when I moved back here, it this new path opened up. And I went, you know what? I need to stop thinking about this because at the end of the day, I I don't regret going to LA for a single second. Right. I failed as hard as anybody can. <laughs> I spent thousands of dollars to go absolutely nowhere other than serve at Buffalo Wild Wings. Yeah. But it taught me so much about myself. Yes. It taught me about how to live, how to deal with failure, how to uh, surround myself with people who are kind and who are caring and being able to adjust from all those different stresses and be like, all right, but what do I really value? Because it turns out I don't value fame and mm -hmm. I didn't value uh, money because I was happy being poor. Mm -hmm. But I did value a sense of safety and a sense of security and a sense of camaraderie that I yeah. was missing. And so I came back and I found that in a different place and I'm much happier. So did I feel like a failure? Absolutely. Do I regret it? Not even a little bit. That's awesome. I mean, that's that. I mean, and I'm sorry for pushing you to say that you felt like a failure. <laughs> no, I, I have no problem. That, that wasn't the point. The point for me is that I think so many people are terrified of failure, and they're so terrified of failure that they won't take the big steps. But failure is so, such a necessary part of. Of, of our progression, mm -hmm. both as humans and in our professional lives. Um, and I mean, the, what you said in there was that really hit me was you learned so much about yourself through that. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of led you back around to being able to find somewhere where you can thrive and mm -hmm. be happy. Um, and that's really what like, I, I enjoy our, our, our listeners being able to kind of hear is like, yeah, you know, failure, it doesn't feel good when it happens but it's such an essential yes. part of our progression. And, and if you don't take those big, scary steps that you might fail at, then you, you, you might never get to the other side where you can actually find a little bit of that tranquility and that, that kind of, you know, that just happiness in, in the spot where you need to be. As we close up here, I'd like to ask our guests 
if they might have any advice for career seekers out there, whether they're, you know, students just entering college, 18 years old, or kind of mid-career looking to change, um, anything like that, what, what would you tell them? I would say that for the majority of freshmen, don't feel like you need to know what you're going to do for the rest of your life at 18, mm -hmm. because you're, you're likely not, and that's okay. Your career may change. Your interests may change. You may go from one thing to another, and that's okay. Instead of focusing on, I need to have the perfect degree, focus on learning. Focus on, on understanding those soft skills. Focusing on making connections because I'm where I'm at, not because of the specific degree that I got, because of the connections I made, because of the things that I learned. And I don't know anybody that has ever looked at my degree for anything other than, yep, you've got it. <laughs> it's much more, what did you learn while you were there? Mm -hmm. And I learned so much. Mm -hmm. So don't stress about having the perfect plan. Stress about having a plan. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you yeah. do have a plan to graduate. <laughs> But focus more on learning, on making connections, on joining clubs, on starting clubs, on connecting with faculty members, because that's where you're going to find success further on is through those connections and through those skills. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And that was my conversation with Daniel. After we got off the air, I told him I really didn't mean to push him too much about saying that he had felt failure, but failure is just such an essential part of the process and coping with it, whether you cope with it after the failure or learning to adjust before, is such a good skill to learn. And I'm so glad that Daniel was honest enough to share his experience with us along his journey. If you're interested in learning more about your career journey, you can visit the ISU Career Center website at isu.edu slash career. Likewise, you can listen to all our past episodes of Pathways on Spotify, YouTube, and at kisu.org slash pathways. Likewise, an episode airs the second Wednesday of every month at 7.30 on KISU. From the Idaho State University Career Center, I'm Mark Beaver, wishing you a fantastic day.